President Michael D. Higgins will convene a rare and unexpected meeting of the Council of State today to examine the potential constitutionality of a new bill criticised for potentially blocking Defence Forces personnel making public remarks. It comes as Jennifer Carroll McNeil, the Minister of State for EU Affairs and Defence, calls for Ireland's defence spending to be doubled because of Russian aggression and the changing circumstances in Europe. Writing in the Sunday Independent, she said the government needs to work steadily towards a €3 billion annual spend on defence. That's twice the current spend. And Jennifer Carol McNeil is with us in our studio this morning. You're very welcome. Good morning, morning, Ireland. The defence bill, uh, the one that President Michael D. Higgins is, uh, is reviewing, is it a gagging order for soldiers? Oh, I mean, there's going back to 1954, we're very, very clear that membership of the Defence Forces is an apolitical activity. And we are not changing the rules beyond the 1954 and the 1990 provisions, which make clear that you sign up to the Defence Forces and you do not join, be a member of, subscribe to political organisations and that you're totally loyal to the Constitution. Those things are absolutely essential in any Defence Forces. What we are doing with this Defence Amendment Bill and with another a, a suite of pieces of legislation is trying to modernise the Defence Forces in different ways. So what we're actually doing in this bill is enabling the representative groups, RACO and PD Fora, to join ICTU as an associate member. As an associate member. So not trade union membership fully, but an associate membership. And that's a big step forward that recognises the representative groups and gives them a larger, weightier voice in, in different ways. But what we're still doing is maintaining the existing blanket a political nature of the defence forces and making it very clear that that, that that should persist and that that's a really important part of our defence forces. Section 11 of the bill says a defence force member may not without prior authorisation comment publicly on a political issue on government policy, attend a public protest or attend a meeting of a political party. What would happen then to a soldier who spoke out on pay or working conditions? Would they, be, well, would they lose their job? We're actually trying to enhance circumstances where we can improve terms and conditions. What we're trying to say though is that a member of defence forces in uniform cannot participate in a protest. But if you're not in uniform, of course you can. And we're trying to make it clear that members of Defence Forces so in uniform... So they can uniform, speak out on, on pay and conditions? Th- well, not only, that, not only that, but we have created additional structures for that and we are improving terms and conditions but all of the time. this section says they can't comment publicly on a political issue on government policy. So the whole range of different government policy issues. So, for example, if we had COVID, for example, it wouldn't be appropriate. The policy includes pay and conditions for the army. And indeed, we are trying to enhance the mechanisms by which that can be enhanced. We are actually including Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the representative organisations as associate members of ICTU. This is enhancing their ability to do that. Not only that, but we are enhancing the internal structures and the HR structures to enhance terms and conditions because this is what we want to do. We want to improve terms and conditions in the Defence Forces. But what we also want to do is make sure that we're maintaining the apolitical nature of the Defence Forces. So this is a that is an extension of the current rules in relation to it uh, and we are enhancing the ability to, to be engaged in enhanced terms and conditions. Okay, just to be clear, yeah. a soldier speaks out on a political issue on government policy, in other words, the paying conditions of that soldier. What happens to them? But it, but but political issues are uh, there's a whole range of things. For example, the deployment uh, just give me of the that defense example. forces. What happens? But it's it's not appropriate that they do that. We have so they lose their job. No, 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 no. Look, we have we have structures for the for the defense forces to be engaged, the representative groups to be engaged, and the whole conversation around terms and conditions, which we are ex- actively enhancing. We are also enabling them to become associate memberships of trade union, which is for the first time a step forward and an enhancement of that platform and of that ability. The reason that we're doing all of those things, along with increasing pay for new people coming into the defense forces, along with enhancing terms and conditions, um, including um, the seagoing allowances, including health benefits, including the upgrade of the facilities at the naval bases. We are doing all of this to make the Defence Forces a more attractive place to be. But it is also important that the Defence Forces, like the judiciary, remain broadly apolitical. Uh, you Separately, you wrote in the Sunday Independent, as I mentioned, about a need to double spending to €3 billion, Euro, and you explained in depth uh, why you felt that was necessary. Where would the money come from? We ha- it comes from general government expenditure, like all budgetary increases w- would come from. Yeah, but you're um, talking about doubling the spend. So in, in order for the government not to uh, overspend any more than it is currently, where, where would you get the money from? Where, where, over, where would it come from in current oh, well, First of all, we have, we, have, we have a surplus this year, as we have over the last number of years. And we have, what I'm saying is that we have to prioritise how we use spend. There's no question but that we, we can't do that, for example, in a year. What I am clearly setting out is that we are building this slowly to get to that figure. We have already increased our defence spend from 1.1 billion to 1.5 
5 billion. And what I'm saying clearly is that we need to continue to, ex- to expedite that increase to get to, three point, to, to get to 3 billion. We, this is clearly set out in the Commission on the Defence Forces level of ambition. We, have, we are at level one, right, which we've said and which the Commission has said is woefully inadequate for our needs. We have said that we are trying to get to level two. Now that means increased spending, but it also means crucially and most importantly, increased recruitment. I am saying that we need to now expedite our ambition to get to level three and get there more quickly than we had hoped. Now that is dependent on us being able to recruit and we have the funds there to be able to recruit but what we want to do is tell people what an opportunity it is to be in the Defence Forces. The increased starting salaries, the fact that you can come out of school and join at a salary of nearly €40,000, that you have the opportunity to be put through college uh, and being paid at the same time, that there are wonderful opportunities to train in engineering, communications, in te- a whole range of different um, extraordinary opportunities within the Defence Forces and that we have enhanced the terms and conditions. That will all require funding you suggested, and I'm suggesting you, you, that we do it more and quickly. And you suggested one way where the funding could come from in your article where you wrote, last year Denmark cancelled a public holiday that it had since the 17th century. It was cancelled to raise €427 million Euros so it, it could increase its defence spending more quickly. Denmark is not on the front line but it understands the danger. So should we follow Den- Denmark's example? Which, which public holiday would you cancel to, to fund I think that's forces? utterly facetious well, but that, I'm, giving that, that, I'm, I'm giving that example I'm giving that example as an opportunity uh, what, the concentration that other countries are putting. Denmark is trying to get to well over 3% within the same period. I'm suggesting that we get, that we build to our own they level of sovereign defence. You, you, you cited the example saying, of them cancelling a public holiday. Would you, do you suggest no, that, that would be a good No, I don't think that's here. necessary here. What I am saying though is that we get from the, the small level of defence spending that we that we currently have and that we build that in a sustainable way. I give that example specifically to show the urgency and the increased risk that other countries are, are experiencing and how they are choosing to react to it. I'm not suggesting that here. But what we, I am saying is that we are so much of an outlier on our defence spend that we need to we need to do this. We don't need to cancel public holidays to do this, but we do need to have a general awareness of the public that this is a necessary change that we need to make and that we need to make it more quickly. And that defence spending in Ireland is a really serious part of the national conversation, that defence spending in Ireland is, is, a, is a critical investment for us and that people should, I hope, understand that not only as we go into a budgetary cycle, not of this year, but over the next three to five years, but that as we go into an okay. election. And these are very, very important matters for our national security. Jennifer Carr McNeil, Minister of State for EU Affairs and Defence. Thank you for coming into our studio today.